But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why, 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. We shall send to the moon 240,000 miles away from the control station in Houston, a giant rocket more than 300 feet tall, the length of this football field, made of new metal alloys, some of which have not yet been invented, capable of standing heat and stresses several times more than have ever been experienced, fitted together with a precision better than the finest watch, carrying all the equipment needed for propulsion, guidance, control, communications, food, and survival on an untried mission to an unknown celestial body, and then return it safely to Earth, re-entering the atmosphere at speeds of over 25,000 miles per hour, causing heat about half that on the temperature of the sun, almost as hot as it is here today, and do all this, and do all this, and do it right, and do it first before this decade is out, then we must be bold. So I'm guessing a lot of you are already familiar with this famous quote. And while going to the moon because it's hard is perhaps justification in itself, I think what John F. Kennedy went on to say was perhaps more important. And what he went on to say was this. So he said that this goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. And for me, it's this part of the speech which is most significant. It's this which makes our history of human endeavor and really pushing our limits so important. It's about channeling our efforts and collaborating to progress and really being the driving force behind research and technological innovation. And JFK went on to talk of the rocket, which would be made of new metal alloys which hadn't yet been invented. But these alloys were made and other challenges overcome. And just seven years after that speech, and only 40 years after we first flew across the Atlantic, Armstrong set foot on the moon. And unfortunately, JFK actually died before this incredible achievement occurred. And now we're looking at going further. So it's been suggested that a manned mission for Mars could launch as early as 2022 with SpaceX. NASA are aiming for 2030. And while the European Space Agency and China are looking at sending astronauts to new parts of the moon. And robotics and unmanned missions are really paving the way. So we've already reached Mars. We've already scratched the surface and sampled the atmosphere. And the much anticipated ExoMars rover is due to launch in just 2020. And now I'm confident that before long, we will develop the technology to send man further into space. And we have to prepare our astronauts so that we're ready for when that day arrives because perhaps the human element may pose the biggest challenge of all. So last year, these two astronauts spent 12 months on the International Space Station. And this was really an amazing opportunity to really research and look at the effects of long-duration spaceflight on the human body. But we're not only using the International Space Station. We're also using a number of terrestrial spaceflight analog platforms as well. And last year, I returned from having spent 14 months living at Concordia Station, where I was working for the European Space Agency. And Concordia is what's known as a spaceflight analog. So what is a spaceflight analog? 
I mean, a space site analog is really just any environment which in some way um, replicates space. So we have lots of different analog programs. So for example, you might have heard of the Nemo project, which is underwater. We've got some in caves. We've got this one, which I think might be popular to a few of you. So getting paid to stay in bed looking at the effects of microgravity. And one crew even spent 500 days in a mock-up spaceship simulating a mission to Mars in a Russian car park. And that's known as Mars 500. And all of these different analog programs are good at telling us different things, so whether it's from research or to astronaut training. And the thing that's interesting about Concordia is the fact that the crew there are completely isolated for nine months. And the reason for that is twofold. The first one is that it's an extreme environment. So this is a screenshot which I took while I was overwintering there. And you might notice it's pretty chilly, so minus 80. And it didn't really get much above minus 70 for the entire overwinter period. And you might also notice that the barometric pressure is actually pretty low as well. And that's because it's like living at the top of Mont Blanc at Concordia, because it's at altitude. Now, the other reason is the long polar night. So we actually go for 105 days where we don't see the sun at all. And if you look at this picture, you can just make out in the bottom left-hand corner there, that's actually my light. And this photo was taken around lunchtime at Concordia. So it really does look like that all throughout the day. You really can see the, like, the Milky Way at breakfast time. And, you know, it really is a strange thing to lose the sun. The sun is that thing, you know, it's the familiar feature that we see in the sky wherever we go in the world. It really feels like it reconnects you with life back home. And to lose that, it really did feel like we're on a different planet. You know, and maybe that's why Concordia is often referred to as White Mars. And so it's these two things together, the long polar night and the extreme environment, which means that Concordia is inaccessible for nine months. And this is even in case of emergency. So let's take the International Space Station. If an astronaut's to have a medical problem, typically we can evacuate them within half a day. But as we're looking at going further into space, this is no longer going to be possible, which is why the medical models and the psychological pressure of living at um, a base like Concordia is so interesting. And that's what we're really doing at a base like Concordia. And after having spent nine months in total isolation, I think that I would have actually found it much harder to been on a different analog program, so for example, Mars 500, where there was an artificial isolation, so essentially a door that you could walk out of. Because I probably would have spent 499 of the 500 days wondering whether or not I should walk out of that door. And you know, whether it's harder or easier, I guess in many ways is irrelevant, because the important point is that it puts a different psychological pressure on the crew. And that's what's interesting about Concordia, and that's what makes it such a good model, model for long-duration spaceflight um, missions of the future, because walking out is not an option. Now, there's a number of other things which also make um, Concordia a good representation of space. So this was my overwinter crew, and it's an international crew, so you have lots of different languages um, and different cultural differences as well. And we're also a skeleton crew, which means that we all have to take on roles above and beyond what we're actually down there to do. So an example of that is the fact that the plumber and the electrician shown in this picture also learned how to scrub into theater, and they were also part of the medical rescue team. And also, before we go, we also have what's called human behavior performance training. And we have this at the European Astronaut Center. And it's the same training that astronauts have before they go to space. So it's all about how to live and work effectively together as part of a, part of a team. <laughs> and because of the really cold temperatures outside, we're also very confined to the base. And you know, it's pretty monotonous. And with that, we have what's called forced human interaction as well. And the landscape out there doesn't really change. So this is what it looks like outside. So if you're into skiing and you're into mountaineering, which I am, it's not really the place to go. So you get, with that comes what we call the sort of sensory deprivation. So I didn't see an old person. I didn't see a young person. I didn't see open stretches of water or vegetation um, for those entire nine months. And we also have water recycling technology down there. 
And Concordia was actually one of the places where we helped to develop the technology which is now currently used up on the International Space Station. So this is one of the prototypes for the one that we're using in space. The only notable difference is that we don't actually extract urine from the, the water down at Concordia. So, you know, my top tip for anyone living down there would certainly be don't pee in the shower. And we also have really sophisticated telemedicine. So this was a practice link to a hospital in Rome. And at Concordia, there's two medical doctors, so myself, the ESA doctor, and also another clinical doctor. And between us and with the help of the specialists remotely, we're able to perform a number of different surgeries. And this really is the kind of model that we're looking at for longer duration spaceflight missions in the future. And all of these things together make Concordia a really interesting analog platform and a place that we can perform research. And we were, we were doing a number of different protocols, so seven protocols in total, and they were looking at the psychology and physiology of the crew overwintering there. Now, unfortunately, I don't have time to go sort of into great detail about all of them, but I just want to give you a bit of a, a flavor and a bit of an overview of some of the science that we're doing down there. So this is one of the first experiments. So we were all wearing activity watches, and these essentially are just a little bit like a Fitbit. So they tell us about our activity levels and also our sleep-wake cycle. But more interestingly than that, these also locate us on the base, and they're also able to interact with each other. So we're able to determine how long crew members are spending together and where they're spending that time on the base. And from this, we're able to look and see how crew dynamics are changing over time. And we're also able to see how personal preferences are changing. So is somebody seeking out social interaction and kind of the spending long periods of time in the sitting room or, or social spaces? Or are they starting to isolate themselves and spending long periods of time in their bedroom and on their own? And really looking at how these habits are changing over time and working at critical time points in the mission where this might be more or less likely to occur. And also where conflicts might be happening within the group. As part of the same experiment, we're doing functional MRI scanning. And we did this before the mission, immediately after, and again six months after the mission. And we're also doing a 10-part cognition test. And so this test was looking at lots of different areas, so for example, reaction times, risk-taking behavior, memory testing. And the idea is that astronauts do this on a regular basis, testing themselves against themselves. And any dip in performance is really just a red flag for mission control to be like, why are they dipping? Are they getting enough sleep? Are they having any emotional problems? But what I like about this experiment is while we were doing it down in Concordia, and this is my friend JP, one of the other crew members, Astronauts were also doing the same experiment up in space. And this really just shows and demonstrates how platforms like Concordia are also really useful for increasing subject numbers, which allows us to develop tools and technology a lot more quickly than if we relied on astronauts alone. And outside at Concordia, we were also looking for extreme bacteria, so extremophiles, which are able to survive outside because, you know, no animals and no bacteria as of yet have been found to be able to survive in the kind of temperatures and environment that we experience at Concordia. And each year, the flavor of the experiments changes. So this is the Soyuz space flight simulator, and this is a new experiment which has come into Concordia. And it's looking at opting, optimizing training schedules over time. Because, you know, it really would be a shame if, after all that time in space, when we do arrive at Mars, if we've forgotten how to land the spaceship. So together, it's hoped that all of this information and all of this research will help inform us about some of the challenges that the astronauts of the future may face. So while a time scale may still be unclear, I believe that within my lifetime, we will return to the moon, and we will see humans walking on Mars. JFK didn't question whether science would provide the answers for us going to the moon. And that vision, you know, that belief in something larger than ourselves can help us overcome almost all obstacles. You know, it really can drive us to do some extraordinary things. 
And it was my belief in deep space missions of the future, which was definitely one of the factors which helped maintain my motivation to live in one of the most extreme natural habitats on this Earth. And it was that same motivation that John Young understood when he went on the first shuttle mission um, in 1981. And, you know, this remains one of my favorite quotes. I love this one. <laughs> so, undoubtedly, we will reach and likely one day inhabit new planets. I think it's important that we don't see this capability as a sort of get-out-of-jail-free card or an excuse not to look after our own planet, Mother Earth. Elon Musk recently described Mars as a fixer-upper of a planet, and I'm inclined to agree. Now, I like renovating, but having spent 14 months and living on um, one of the closest environments on Earth to Mars, with the added bonus of oxygen and a little bit more gravity, you know, I really did feel like I was pushing my own limits at 14 months. And so, if I was to consider a one-way ticket anywhere, I think it would have to be much more like this <laughs> than like this, even if Matt Damon was there. <laughs> so I agree with Walkowitz from NASA's Kepler mission when she described moving to Mars like saying that the real party is on the lifeboats when the Titanic is sinking. And for me, a journey deeper into space is about getting there and about coming home. As JFK said, of returning safely to Earth. But it's not just about bringing the crew home, but also what we learn along the journey as well. And we only have to look as far as Concordia to really see how that's possible. So while all the f experiments that I was doing were focusing out towards space, they all had medical applications which are relevant to life back on Earth. And one experiment which I think demonstrates this well is one that was looking at the effects of artificial lighting on our eyesight after a long period of time. So while of course this data is useful to astronauts and the fairly small group of Antarctic overwinterers, it's also relevant to a large population um, who are using artificial lighting for long periods of time. So for example, factory workers. Last week at the European Astronaut Center, I walked on the moon using virtual reality. And in that same week, I tried virtual reality for surgical training. And it really just demonstrates how, how some of the techniques we're using for spaceflight research are now helping us also in our day-to-day -day lives. And the applications go much wider than healthcare, but because this is my area of expertise, that's what I've chosen to focus on just to give you a few more examples. So let's take disaster response. So this is imagery from the Copernicus Earth Observation Satellite. And here we can see the extent of some flooding during a natural disaster. And space technology really has improved how we're able to respond to disasters like these. So with improved geospatial mapping and satellite imagery and improved communications on the ground. And also, remote medicine's been affected. So we've got improved telemedicine, and we've got online uh, medical uh, sort of educational programs as well, which is helping to improve access to medical care in remote and developing communities. And robotics is changing the face of surgery today and changing our capabilities. And it's also changing the way that we make our medicines. So we're actually able to grow much better crystals using microgravity, so up in space, than we are able to on Earth. And research in space is teaching us new things about the human body every day. So let's not only go to space because it's hard or because it's there, but let's go because of what we can learn from the journey and because of what we can bring home. Let's use the goal of traveling deeper into space to organize and challenge the best of our energies and skills once more. Let's collaborate. Let's inspire. Let's research and develop new technology and use what we learn on Earth today. So Mars isn't required as a lifeboat, but rather is the Antarctic program of the future, a research platform a stepping stone for further challenges and further advancement of humankind. Thank you.